Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for logging in for the first installment of our three-part briefing mini-series about the transportation sector and climate change. Today, we will explore ports leading the way on mitigation and resilience. I am Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and clean climate change policies uh, to policymakers. We have also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. And through it all, whether we're working on Capitol Hill or with partners in a rural utility service territory, we are always focused on solutions from mitigation to adaptation and resilience. Resilience has been a major area of focus for ESI recently. Just three weeks ago, we released a report, for us the first of its kind, that compiled 30 policy recommendations based on the findings of our 16-part coastal resilience briefing series. Now, I have a certain bias for this, uh, of course, but if you're interested in coastal resilience, and in particular how Congress and the federal government could better support community-based approaches to adaptation and resilience, I encourage you to take a look at our report, A Resilient Future for Coastal Communities. It is available for download at www.esi.org, along with an archive of our October 29th online briefing that featured the return of four panelists from our original 16-part series. And when you visit us online, I also hope you will sign up for Climate Change Solutions, our bi-weekly newsletter. It really is the best way to keep track of our briefings, our fact sheets, and other assorted goings on, and ensure that you never miss a thing. Today, we will hear from practitioners working with maritime stakeholders at ports to advance climate change and mitigation, or uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, sorry. Ports are complex operations, and today's panelists bring on the ground perspectives of what's working and what's not to address climate change. As we did with our coastal resilience report, we present to you today case studies as models and examples for others to emulate. You will hear about some great work at two major ports, but to really address climate change, we need to significantly scale up this work. And that very likely requires attention from Congress and federal agencies. We have three speakers today, so I'm gonna skip right ahead to introducing them so we have plenty of time for questions and answers. But two things first. Number one, this is the first of a three-part mini-series this week. Tomorrow, at the same time, we will be taking a look at the future of low emissions commercial aviation. And on Thursday, we'll have a roundtable discussion with representatives from three leading transportation authorities about public transit. So please join us for our second and third online briefings this week. And number two, let me, ask, let me explain how you can ask us questions. We're not together in person today. So if you have a question, you have two options to ask it. First, you can send us a message on Twitter at EESI online, or you can send us an email at EESI at EESI.org. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions during our question and answer period after our third panelist presents. And now on to our first panelist of the day. I'd like to introduce Joshua Berger. He is the governor's maritime sector lead for the state of Washington. Joshua works as the liaison between the maritime industry stakeholders, uh, the governor's office, the state legislature, and state agencies. As director of maritime, he focuses on economic development, uh, building uh, public-private partnerships, and ensuring a 21st century workforce. In his role, Joshua managed the development of Washington State strategy for the blue economy for a sustainable, decarbonized maritime industry alongside the development of a maritime innovation center. He also founded Washington Maritime Blue, an independent cluster organization to implement the state strategy and serves as its chairman of the board. Joshua, welcome to our briefing today. Can't wait for your presentation. Hey, Dan, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, share a bit of our story uh, and uh, engage with the other panelists as well. So I, uh, this is a, a great afternoon. Thank you. Um, I'll share my screen here and get a chance to um, uh, uh, introduce myself. I want to make sure we're all on this good to go and get screens up. Great. All new feats here as we are uh, living in a virtual, living in a virtual reality. So thank you. Um, uh, I pre appreciate the introduction and just the opportunity. Uh, Joshua Berger, Dan, thank you for for the introduction. I don't have to go much further than that. But what I what I am excited to do, um, uh, as we've been doing a lot lately, is sharing this model that we've built here in Washington State, along with uh, a whole host of partners 
the quadruple helix, we call it, um, in how we accelerate, draw investment, uh, all towards this end of the blue economy, which is really, right, sustainability, uh, clean energy, environmental awareness, ecological health, and community resiliency and equity in the maritime and ocean space broadly. And we'll do some focus on the work we're doing specifically at the ports. Um, but it's this model for how we collaborate and how we draw investment towards this work to accelerate innovation in this space that I'm excited to share. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of sharing lately uh, as we're all looking towards uh, what we've dubbed uh, building back blue. We're excited about sharing this model for that. So some quick context uh, for Washington State um, up here in the great Pacific Northwest, our maritime industry alone uh, is a $37 billion economic driver for our state. So we'll just kind of start with the context. Um, uh, you can uh, look at that nationally as well. It's very diverse uh, and incredibly interdependent, creates living wage jobs and draws investment. Um, so we start, we start with that here in Washington. And then of course, uh, we boast quite well that we are actually already leaders in environmental performance and best management practices um, uh, in the work that we're doing, fourth largest container gateway in the United States, the largest ferry system in the United States. We manage uh, one of the most sustainable and largest fishing grounds in the world, up in Alaska in the Bering uh, Sea from Washington State. Incredible research happening in underwater ocean technology, ocean science and research, uh, and a great system of workforce development. So we're starting uh, proudly from uh, this from from this place. And over the last number of years, we've recognized that this notion of the blue economy, this is the World Bank's definition that we share, um, has been growing. This idea, this incredible shift and in focus around maritime sustainability, clean energy. Um, you know, nation states and NGOs around the globe have been developing these plans. Um, and uh, we've been following with great interest in how they're doing this work. But it's not just NGOs and other state governments, industry has been engaged. The OECD tells us that the blue economy is going to triple by the year 2030 to $3 trillion. Um, uh, just for point of note, that's about twice, or sorry, three times the global space industry. Uh, if we're focused on innovation and sustainability. And so industry has taken that note as well in our forming coalitions, plans, uh, uh, ways in which they're going to invest towards this work. So we took that cue here in Washington State and said, you know what, um, let's take a lead here and create our strategy for the blue economy. How are we gonna bring our stakeholders together, draw investment, public and private, and accelerate innovation? There's no reason why we are not a center of excellence for that work. So the governor put together a, an advisory council, 18 months of broad stakeholder uh, work, uh, and we developed really the first and still only comprehensive strategy for the blue economy. Um, you can see it's a focus on decarbonization, innovation, working waterfronts, growing gateways, a diverse and equitable workforce, and that we do that in an organized way. Of course, there's great detail, and I encourage you to go take a look at the detail. There's a lot there that can be modeled and had been has been modeled from what's happening globally. Um, but we very quickly understood that a strategy is just a strategy. It's about as good as its graphics and the shelf you put it on if you're not implementing and accountable to the work. And when we went around the globe, we looked at other centers of excellence and, and asked, you know, how are you getting this done? How are you getting this engagement between the public and private sector, research institutions, community organizations? And uh, about across the board, there was this model of what we call a formal uh, innovation cluster organization that very intentionally brings together that quadruple helix uh, towards a mission, in this case, implementing our state strategy for the blue economy. So we formed Washington Maritime Blue. Just two years later, we're nearly 100 members long, looking at that quadruple helix of industry, our public partners in government, research institutions, and organizational partners, all with this mission together of working towards a growing, thriving maritime economy, a healthy ocean marine environment, and equitable and resilient communities. And that takes place in a number of different ways. We have uh, kind of our, our, our scope of work, the six blue Fs we call them, 
course, we do work around marketing and communicating, certainly our members, but the opportunities around the blue economy broadly. This is a global effort. Um, we hold networking and knowledge sharing events we call Blue Forums. Uh, we have uh, workforce programs with a specific focus on uh, bringing uh, particularly youth of color and young women into opportunities, awareness and opportunities in the maritime industry. Uh, and then what I want to share with you today is the models we have around how we attract finance and how we bring together partners in what we call joint innovation projects and support entrepreneurship and innovation. So I can share some examples of some of that. We took some cues from our friends uh, in Norway and Portugal and France and um, uh, uh, in Japan and, and looked at this model called a joint industry project or joint innovation project. And it's where we bring our members together. I'll say it just quite frankly, to get stuff done. It's how we drive investment towards key demonstration projects like electrifying the uh, country's largest ferry system. Um, like developing uh, zero emission fast ferries uh, that um, uh, of course are, are zero emission but are quiet and mindful of marine mammals and uh, creating jobs and um, addressing transportation issues uh, in our region. So this is where we bring together our members. So a member comes to us and says, hey, we've got a concept design. We wanna take it to the next level. How do we bring funding to get to full construction, understand the economic impact, environmental benefits, go out and find an operator with a route we know is gonna work and be specific. And that's where the cluster organization comes into play. We act as project managers and uh, we can attract and bring capital uh, and funding from multiple different places. In this case, we uh, were awarded a federal transit authority grant along with funding from local ports and uh, are engaging right now with private investors on a potential route for this project. Um, other exciting projects we're working on is a, a green hydrogen uh, production at the port of Tacoma, actually. Um, this is um, a, a demonstration of storing uh, high density hydrogen in a liquid carrier, which is uh, safe uh, and very efficient, which has great implications for deep sea shipping, but in this case would be used for essentially acting as a generator for um, uh, uh, for ships to plug in for cold ironing or for ships to plug in when they're tied uh, to the pier. Um, has great implications also for resiliency as well. Um, in other areas, we're working on uh, scaling a whale report alert system uh, to address um, uh, 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 noise issues with marine mammals, particularly our southern resident killer whales, um, which is of great interest to us. And then more recently, we've just in invested and funded uh, this program through an Economic Development Administration grant um, in developing some a predictive analytics tool to do early detection of COVID-19, which we're piloting with the fisheries and maritime sector with uh, great hopes uh, with IHME uh, to then share that with uh, various different sectors, agriculture, food, uh, food processing, uh, and out into communities. So please stay tuned and watch this work. Uh, I think this will have great even global implications uh, where maritime and fisheries is a great place to start. So how do we bring money towards these things and, and, uh, and, and the new ideas that are changing the shape uh, in the maritime and ocean space? Well, one is, you know, we knew that capital was having a hard time understanding and flowing towards these type of projects. So we started here locally just to get a sense of what type of capital, what flavor of capital from public grants to strict venture capital, how does it get to maritime and ocean projects? What, what's appropriate? What's out there? Um, you know, we a great understanding that there's a need for early stage capital to, to commercialize these new technologies. Venture capital is not aware. Uh, and what a great role there is for both public funds and philanthropic funds to de-risk some of those early investments. And that our cluster organization and the many others that we engage with are great pipelines into these types of investments. Um, What's also interesting is that it's multifaceted. We're talking here about maritime ports and shipping, but the crossover in technology, the tech transfer that's happening right now is remarkable. Certainly global uh, and national regulations are pulling markets and we have, even, I think, even more work to do to pull those markets forward. 
um, the technology costs, that like battery costs are reducing dramatically. Uh, and there is really global cooperation around this work. So all of that kind of breeds opportunities for investment. But we also know that as broad and diverse as the opportunities are, also need to be the types of capital. Um, and these all can play with one another, which is again, why we feel like this cluster organization is a great way to blend, you know, what we call the proverbial hybrid stack of capital to get these demonstration projects going. Um, but we also need to focus on those entrepreneurs uh, and the innovation that's happening incredibly fast. We started our first maritime innovation accelerator. We brought in 11 companies uh, from around the country, actually around the globe. We set this up and immediately got 125 applications and everywhere from Kazakhstan, Copenhagen to Spokane, Washington, and certainly in our hometowns here in, in Seattle. We chose these 11 companies. They're very diverse. This is everything from sustainable seafood snacks to marine batteries to digital drayage truck solutions and across the board. That was intentional for us because we know that um, private capital is new to the space and we wanted to show them the breadth of the types of investments that they can make. We're now um, uh, incredibly successful in this first round. One of our companies uh, just a month ago announced a $32 million Series A round, a number of angel investments uh, and lots of other uh, great um, things to report out of this. So we went ahead and we are now recruiting for our second wave um, and actually expanding the type of work we do with entrepreneurs, not just in this accelerator style in Seattle, but in Everett uh, in Washington State, in Tacoma in Washington State. We have maritime communities across the state and all of them may focus on different things and in different ways. And our cluster organization is there essentially to be a nest and support them with early demonstration projects, early sales, possibly corporate uh, uh, investment and partnering on these big projects. And I guess the one last thing I wanted to say is, um, this is an incredible model that we have been in communication with our friends in Rhode Island and Alaska and Georgia uh, and Mississippi and Massachusetts, um, kind of building these models together. We are just one part of this global enterprise of the blue economy. And in any given day, a founder from one of my accelerators will go uh, to uh, Oslo for the Catapult Ocean. We've got capital flowing in from Singapore. Uh, we're partnering with our friends in San Diego and Boston to create clear impact metrics and share potential funders and investors. So this is, um, we're part of something global. The, there is one ocean. Uh, there is one, you know, large maritime and shipping and port system across the globe. Uh, and uh, we're really only um, going to be able to build black blue uh, by uh, building together. So um, we're always glad to continue to tell the, the story, uh, to find ways in which this model can work uh, in DC to support cluster organizing and uh, innovation. Uh, across the space nationally. And um, it's working for us. And uh, we're excited to continue to find partners both with um, uh, federal, our federal partners in DC and other ports around the globe. So I'll leave it there and uh, look forward to answering questions uh, when we get to that point. Thank you, Dan. Oh, thank you, Joshua. That was a really cool presentation. Um, and thanks for humoring my East Coast time zone bias. Good morning is what I meant to say to you. So it's afternoon for some of us, uh, including our next panelist. Um, quick reminder, uh, if you missed any of Josh's, Joshua's presentation or if you would like access to his slides, uh, visit us online, www.eesi.org. Uh, you'll find um, all the materials from today's briefing, um, as well as written summaries over the next couple of days. They'll get posted and so they'll help you um, orient yourself if you if you happen to miss anything, make it easier for you to find it. Um, also, if you have any questions for Joshua or for our next panelist, um, you can ask us questions two different ways. The first is by following us on Twitter at EESI online and sending a question in that way. You can also send us a, send us an email EESI at EESI.org. Uh, and now I will introduce our second and third speakers as a pair because they will be co-presenting. Um, the first of the two is Jill Lemke. Jill is the manager of strategic planning and special projects at the Maryland Port Administration, where her responsibilities include planning for climate resilience, 
She has over 25 years of experience in the public and private sectors. She holds a bachelor's degree in communications, a master's degree in regional planning, and is a certified port executive and certified climate change professional. And then our second of the two, so number two and number three, I think that's the better way to say that, uh, is Kristen Keene. Kristen currently serves as the Innovative Reuse Program Manager at the Port of Baltimore. Through this role, uh, Kristen leads a variety of activities related to the innovative reuse and beneficial use of dredged sediments, including the identification and implementation of reuse uh, projects, dredged material blending studies, regulatory and policy initiatives, interagency coordination and community outreach and stakeholder engagement. Uh, Kristen holds degrees from Salisbury University, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, and the American Military University. So welcome, Jill and Kristen. Looking forward to your presentations. Thank you, Dan. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Um, Joshua's presentation showed us sort of a uh, more global view, and we are going to be taking you down to a more on the ground view in the perspective of a single port. Um, I am a, the manager of strategic planning and special projects. One of those special projects is climate resilience. To start, I wanna give you an introduction to the Port of Baltimore and the Maryland Port Administration. We are a department underneath the umbrella of the Maryland Department of Transportation. Unlike other ports around the country, we are not an independent port authority. Our mission is to increase the flow of waterborne commerce through the state of Maryland and in a manner that benefits the citizens of the state. Um, as part of our vision that ties back into resilience, um, we are committed to acting as a good steward of Maryland's nat natural environment. And Baltimore has had a long and great maritime history. The Port of Baltimore was founded in 1706. It is older than the city itself and the city of Baltimore and much of Maryland grew up around the Port of Baltimore. Um, when I talk about the Port of Baltimore, I'm not talking about the Maryland Port Administration. The Port of Baltimore is a complex mix of both private and public facilities that incorporate 45 miles of waterfront. Um, 23 of those facilities are public and six are publicly owned MPA terminals. Because of that complex mix, we have um, active relationships with public and private sector entities, um, as well as government organizations on the state, local, and national level. Um, our port is a nationally significant port. We generate 37,000 jobs in the state of Maryland. 15,000 of those are direct port jobs, which um, we are proud of because of our mission to uh, benefit the citizens of the state. Um, we like to provide jobs at a living wage for people with a variety of educational um, levels and the average port salary for those 15,000 direct jobs is 9.5 percent higher than the statewide average wage. Um, so we are a significant engine for the economy of the state of Maryland. Um, from a national perspective, we're number one in autos and roll-on roll-off equipment imports and exports. Um, we're number one in imported gypsum, number two in sugar and coal. And from a value perspective, we're number nine in the US mm -hmm. and from a cargo tonnage perspective, 11th in the US. Um, when you picture a marine terminal, you can probably imagine that we are on the water. Um, and because of that, we are susceptible to the impacts of climate change and sea level rise. In addition, um, we are on the Chesapeake Bay in the state of Maryland, and you can tell from the graph that our water levels have been rising for the past 100 years, um, essentially because of sea level rise, but also because of land, land subsidence around the Chesapeake Bay since the last ice age. So we are familiar with the impacts of both weather and the sea in terms of our operations. Um, the state of Maryland is a leader in um, acting on climate change um, and in 2010 as a result of action on a state level 
policy, um, we developed the climate change vulnerability assessment that looked at all of our facilities in the Port of Baltimore and then turned that vulnerability assessment, which largely focused on sea level rise, um, to develop an approach to um, our operations and projects to identify ways that we can address some of those vulnerabilities. And we developed a three-pronged approach. Um, the first prong is migrate. For any project we are planning, we look at whether or not that function needs to be near the water and therefore in the flood zone. Um, if the answer is no, we will move it out of the floodplain and off of the terminal. The answer to that question is very often no, um, because we need to be near the water in order to operate. So the next step in that three-prong process is to determine whether or not um, that function or building or facility could be elevated. Um, the state of Maryland has a free board requirement um, for state facilities in the flood zone that is two feet above the annual flood elevation or the 100-year flood elevation. Um, and we look at, is that possible or feasible um, for our operations? If the answer is no, um, we will look to mitigation and how can we mitigate that project to reinforce or strengthen it in order to withstand any potential damage or impacts of climate related um, activities or events. Um, and I'm going to give some more examples of that later on. So as we prepare for resilience, we look at um, resilience within each capital project in the design and through the engineering process. Um, we're also looking at the reuse of dredge material for resilience projects outside of our immediate terminals. And Kristen will touch on that a little bit later. And we are identifying partnerships um, similar to what's happening in Washington. Um, we look to uh, universities, federal, state, and local partners and NGOs to um, examine the research and what is happening in the larger system. We are also investigating electric and microgrid improvements um, to maintain emergency power, both for con continuity of operations and security, um, to maintain the security of the port during um, events and emergencies. Um, I mentioned that climate change for us largely means sea level rise and flooding um, from storm surge, but um, we also suffer the impacts of extreme rain events, um, extreme temperatures impacting operations, high winds, snow, ice, and hail events. As, a, uh, as the number one auto port, hail, a hail event could cause significant damage to the cargo on the terminal um, and then increased sedimentation in our um, federal channels. Um, we focus on sea level rise and flooding partly because the science is there and there's more information about the potential risks. Um, and now I'm gonna go through a couple of examples of how we have implemented that three-pronged approach to um, climate adaptation on our terminals. Um, this photo is an example of a stormwater vault that we have um, placed underneath the cargo storage areas on our terminal. Um, partly to meet state stormwater management requirements, but also to um, hold on to significant amounts of water that have fallen on the terminals through micro microburst extreme rain events that we've been having more and more frequently in um, the mid-Atlantic region. This is another example. This project was paid for through a TIGER grant from the federal government. Um, we did some dredging and used that dredge material to um, partially fill the Fairfield Marine Terminal wet basin, which is, um, was in this footprint that you see in the photo. Um, and as a result of the project, used it as an opportunity to add additional stormwater management facilities. This is a um, large vault and sand filter system underneath the terminal. Um, 
And because of the implementation of this infrastructure, we were also able to elevate this portion of the new cargo space that was constructed as a result of that TIGER grant. And this photo shows the after image of where um, cars will be stored. Um, they are current, it is currently being used, but it shows the perspective of how um, the elevation is, is five feet above the remainder of the terminal. Um, and that is for future storm surge protection, um, as well as that underground stormwater management system. This is an aerial view of Dundalk Marine Terminal. This is our largest work, workhorse terminal. It's 575 acres. As you can imagine, when we look at um, doing improvements to Dundalk Marine Terminal, um, and we ask ourselves, how do we elevate this? Um, elevating 575 acres is not a viable alternative, um, not to mention the fact that 100% of our um, cargo space on Dundalk is leased to customers. And you can see all of the um, customers' equipment um, and, and vehicles and storage um, in, the, um, in the buildings is largely forest products. We also do imports and exports of forest products. So um, as an alternative to elevating the terminal, as we begin to renovate or replace berths along the outside, Dundalk has 11 um, marine berths. We will be um, implementing a climate resilience and adaptation system that includes a new stormwater culvert so that the terminal can be separated from the city's stormwater system. Um, and that will include stormwater pumps, um, backflow preventers, and a 32 inch sea curb, as we call it, which is essentially a small seawall to prevent um, storm surge overtopping onto the terminal and causing damage to both equipment um, and uh, cargo. And uh, that project is a $36 million project that will take place over a series of years. Um, the first phase will include permanent barriers as well as temporary barriers as we work our way around the terminal and replace each individual berth and will be paid for um, in part by a $10 million uh, infra grant um, from the federal government. And this uh, graph is intended to show that we are also looking at our, our um, environmental footprint um, in the four year period between 2012 and 2016, our cargo actually increased 10% um, over that time period. And our emissions, thanks to a number of um, programs and initiatives have decreased by 19%, including a 23% decrease in um, CO2 emissions. And we're pretty proud of those numbers um, and we'll be having new numbers shortly. We do these every four years. Um, and as a transition to my colleague, I wanted to introduce um, that we also do mitigation projects outside of our terminal when we can't do um, stormwater mitigation on the terminal. This is a project that we partnered with um, Anne Arundel County um, Parks and Recreation to do a living shoreline um, to help um, an area of their facility that had suffered serious erosion. Um, we rebuilt the shoreline and um, worked with the kids to plant native grasses and this project um, was put into place last year. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kristen, to talk about our dredge material program. Good afternoon, thank you, Jill. Uh, my name is Kristen Keene. I serve as the Innovative Reuse Program Manager at the Maryland Port Administration. And moving on, when it comes to ports and sustainability, we typically focus on the actual terminal facilities. But there's much more to the equation when you consider the unique requirements necessary to keep the port open for business, which brings me to the management of dredge material. Here at the Port of Baltimore, we turn sediments into solutions. Major shipping channels in the Chesapeake Bay and Baltimore Harbor are maintained at a 50 foot depth, while others are maintained at a 35 foot depth. Next slide.
Jill, next slide, thank you. Um, maintaining safe and navigable channels serving the Port of Baltimore helps to keep us competitive, especially among the ports situated along the Eastern Seaboard. The Maryland Port Administration in partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers share the important responsibility of keeping our marine highway open, which spans about 136 miles. Each year, almost 5 million cubic yards of sediment is removed from these shipping channels. To put that into context, that volume would fill the Ravens football stadium about two times every single year. Next slide. Space in our upland containment facilities is very limited, especially in the Baltimore Harbor, which is why new sustainable solutions are needed. This leads us to innovative reuse and beneficial use. In Maryland, we have two distinct definitions for these terms, but to put it briefly, innovative reuse refers to on-land applications for the dredge material, while beneficial use refers to in-water uses for the sediment. Next slide. In recent years, we've made a lot of progress on reusing dredge material generated from the Baltimore Harbor. Our portfolio of upland applications for dewatered sediment includes end uses such as habitat development, daily landfill cover, remedial capping material, and engineered fill. We continue to expand our ingenuity and increase our ability to sustainably reuse the never-ending resource that is dredge material. Next slide. In addition to the upland uses for sediment, the Port of Baltimore has also been internationally recognized for a very large-scale beneficial use project, 1,715 acres to be exact. In the 1800s, about 100 residents called Poplar Island home. And by the 1920s, all of the residents retreated due to erosion and sea level rise. The island then became a hunting retreat that welcomed both President Roosevelt and President Truman. Now in 1996, only five acres remained of this once treasured island. Through a partnership between the Maryland Port Administration and the Army Corps of Engineers, the island has since been restored using dredge material to create 776 acres of tidal wetlands, 829 acres of upland habitat, and 110 acre open water embayment. Next slide. Now Poplar Island will reach its capacity of 69.8 million cubic yards in a little over a decade from now. In anticipation of Poplar's finite capacity, we are planning for the mid Chesapeake Bay Island Restoration Project which would beneficially use sediment from the Port of Baltimore's 50-foot channel, provide 90 to 95 million cubic yards of dredge material placement capacity, restore remote island habitat, as well as provide shoreline protection and resiliency for a nearby county and its property owners. Next slide. With that, we thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Jill, for a really great um, presentation tag team. Um, as a Maryland resident, thanks also for being good state employees uh, and doing great uh, work keeping, keeping um, taking good care of the Port of Baltimore. Um, and uh, I'm also very pleased that you managed to fit in a, a Ravens, uh, an M&T Bank Stadium uh, reference, Kristen. It wouldn't have been a Maryland State presentation without, without one like that, so thank you for that. Um, now it is time to shift to questions and answers. And uh, before I introduce my colleague to take it away, uh, if you have a question, um, there are two ways to get it to us. The first is by following us on Twitter at EESI online. The second is by sending us an email at or EESI at EESI.org. Uh, we will do our best to get to all of them that we can. Um, but to kick off the question and answer period, let me introduce my colleague, Amber Todorov. Amber is a, on our policy team. Uh, was an integral member of the team that put out our Coastal Resilience Report a couple weeks ago um, and uh, had a big hand at organizing this week's series of briefings. And in fact, I think she was the one who came up with the idea of doing these multi-day mini-series when we did Climate Adaptation Data Week uh, back in April. So Amber, uh, I'll let you take it away and looking forward to a great discussion. Thanks a lot, Dan, and thank you to our excellent speakers. Uh, first question, to what extent are ports sharing information about and collaborating on adaptation and resilience efforts? I know you talked a little bit about this, Joshua, in an international context, but I guess if you could elaborate on a domestic context and if there's any federal um, resources that are facilitating that. And I'd love to hear um, from Jill and Kristen as well. 
Yeah, well, Jill and Kristen may have some more details. I mean, there's a number of port associations that are helping to lead that work and provide some great context for that as well. Um, MARAD does a really good job, particularly in terms of um, helping to support what federal resources are coming through MARAD, but also through, you know, build grants, tiger grants, et cetera. So, Jill, you may have some more detail. Yeah, we work very closely with the American Association of Ports Authorities um, to share best practices and um, information and to uh, keep up on what's happening on a federal level. We have partnerships with federal agencies, which also serve other ports um, and make connections with them that way um, through the Army Corps of Engineers, through the U.S. Department of Transportation and MARAD. Um, to name a few. We also have participate in um, information exchanges uh, like this one um, and others sponsored by universities and research organizations. And I don't know if Kristen had anything to add. Yeah, I can also add that um, we participate in the Western Judging Association or WIDA, and that brings together many state and federal partners in the maritime community. So it allows us an opportunity to collaborate with other ports and federal agencies and learn about advancements, what other ports are doing, and you know, how do we emulate those activities across the board. You know, I'd be remiss not to, as I mentioned, the, the great leadership that the Department of Energy uh, has brought. Department of Energy and NOAA both have really been leading, at least on this, and, and helping to nationally for us to define the blue economy. Department of Energy, we partnered with them. We ran a, a blue forum called um, uh, R&D for, for Marine Energy Solutions. And really was an opportunity for all of the federal research institutions to come and share with industry, what, what research are they doing? Hydrogen, ammonia, fuels of the future, battery technology, and then an opportunity for them to then engage with industry to say, well, we're all really focused on going this way. Let's make sure our R&D efforts are also going this way. And DOE has led a lot of that with the national labs too. Of course, PNNL is in our backyard, Pacific Northwest National Lab, uh, but NREL and Sandia, all the like. So there is, some, there is some leadership coming in terms of helping us nationally define the blue economy. We just don't yet have the mechanisms um, to be honest, within the federal government, because the blue economy is a horizontal. It's in NOAA, it's in DOE, it's in EPA, it's in MARAD. Uh, so it's hard to define, it's hard to understand where those agencies can work together. How do they join together in funding opportunities? DOE and EDA though, just um, we were fortunate to be awardees of the EDA Build to Scale grant, uh, supporting cluster innovation specifically in the blue economy. And that was jointly funded between EDA and the Department of Energy. Um, so there, there are some spigots of it starting to happen, but there's yet to really be a coordinated approach broadly for clean energy and maritime, blue economy, and all that exists there. Great answers, thanks very much. The second question is, what are the next steps for the, uh, on the horizon for electrification at ports? And uh, what barriers exist now preventing the broader electrification at ports? Um, I can start with that. Um, we have looked at electrification. We've studied it um, and looked at the feasibility. We actually just got a grant from the Maryland Energy Administration to study the feasibility of microgrids. Um, we have looked at shore power. Um, because of the nature of our port, uh, ships aren't staying at port very long. Um, we have a very efficient port. Um, so the uh, cost benefit analysis of the shore power right now, um, when we did the study was not favorable um, because they're just not in port long enough to justify powering down and plugging in. Um, but we are continuing to look at that as an option. Um, one of the challenges is the nature of the port. We are a landlord port. Um, we provide the infrastructure that our customers need. And so 
organizing and working with our customer base, um, the shipping companies and the cargo owners um, to address energy needs um, is a longer term effort that we are um, hoping to embark on through our strategic planning process. Um, but it is something that is very much on our minds and um, we are exploring options, but nothing, um, nothing to report on in terms of implementation as of yet. Now this, this is a, a really key topic for us in Washington for a number of reasons. Um, uh, one is, you know, we've done a tremendous amount of looking at the uh, air quality impacts of our major terminals and uh, particularly impacting um, uh, disadvantaged communities and, and where our ports lie, but really across the whole region just because of the geography of Puget Sound. Um, uh, and so we've, we've, uh, we've gone down a road here pretty quickly, both in terms of trying to electrify uh, and implementing now electrification of, uh, of our ferry system. We are in the process of converting our two largest uh, uh, vessels, the Jumbo Mark IIs, and building five new all-electric ferries as well. And these are, you know, these are 200 car, you know, 2,000 passenger ferries uh, that are plying across Puget Sound. Uh, every 35 minutes and when they come into port they need 10 megawatts of power for nine minutes every 35 minutes so how do you have a grid that can support that kind of power and so we are working uh, very closely uh, with the various utilities in our state that also means for the 25 uh, routes they, we have uh, eight different utilities we have to engage with uh, sometimes different utilities on the same route often different utilities in the same route so we're actively engaging uh, in that right now. It's gonna require energy storage solutions, microgrid and new technology solutions. Uh, our state is investing in some of that. We are looking at uh, various different federal sources for that work. Um, and, and again, it, you know, for another example, ferries have a very traditional path in looking towards federal dollars to support uh, uh, infrastructure for ferries. Now they're looking at new paths around uh, energy storage, microgrid solutions. Um, so there's a whole kind of new way in which we are looking at how we uh, electrify our ports. We were also fortunate enough to get um, a good amount of the Volkswagen settlement dollars that we've invested heavily into electrifying our ports as well. I also wanted to touch a little bit on that um, because we have Volkswagen um, funds as well. Um, and we have been working with our uh, partners um, to replace uh, or repower cargo handling equipment motors um, through the use of those funds as well as DERA grant funds. Um, so all of our cranes now are uh, electric. Um, they have been converted over and the new cranes um, that should be coming in 2021 will be electric. Um, and we've also worked with uh, the state of Maryland as part of a Northeast Corridor initiative to study the um, electrification of the freight network in terms of um, via electric vehicles, including um, electric freight um, delivery vehicles. So we are looking at those aspects as well in order to um, further reduce our climate footprint. And the, the challenge is some of that, Jill, Jill mentioned this, is this is a global um, effort, right? We have multiple carriers, multiple operators, various different, um, the ports here in Washington are also landlord ports. So multiple terminal operators. How do you just agree on what type of shore power plug you're gonna use? And you would imagine the amount of coordination uh, and agreement of bringing all those different uh, manufacturers and OEMs in the room and asking them to leave their business managers at home and bring their engineers and help us together uh, define what the shore power plug of the future is going to be so that when they come to LA Long Beach, they can use the same plug than when they come to Seattle or go around uh, to Baltimore, right? And so that's a challenge in and of itself. That's part of why we are so um, excited about the use of something independent like a cluster organization because you've noticed we have every major OEM, ABB, Wartzilla, Siemens, um, 
as part of this organization, they recognize that they have to come up with standards together and they can use something like this cluster organization as a place for competitors to come together and create standards together. Because uh, that's what's going to be necessary when we have a better idea about what short power plug we're going to use off the shelf technology. But then also when we start understanding what kind of, you know, billions, trillions of dollars in infrastructure are we going to need to build to have the fuel of the future, a zero emission fuel of the future. Um, that's going to take even more coordination, R&D and commercialization and technology. And we need these mechanisms in order to accelerate that. Uh, thanks. That was really interesting. And Jill, I'm happy that you mentioned the grant from MEA. I'm an MEA alumnus. So whenever I hear about a microgrid grant, it warms my heart. So um, way to go. Um, this one's come from our audience, uh, this question. And I think it's kind of interesting. And Joshua, you might have just touched on a little bit of it. Question is, how do you work with your sort of neighbors in waterfront in poor areas? Um, most of most waterfront areas are under a lot of pressure from development. Um, and those new developments probably also have resilience concerns and resilience challenges. Um, Jill, in your presentation, you showed a photo of the port. And it's a pretty wide, it covers a lot of ground and it covers a lot of type of, types of land use. And so maybe Jill, we'll start with you and then we'll hear from Kristen and Joshua about sort of in your port situation, how do you, compare, how do you work together with people who are trying to otherwise develop you know, that pretty precious land in a, in a pretty important city? Um, I'm glad you asked that question because that's what I spend a lot of my time on. Um, I came to the Port of Baltimore from Baltimore City Department of Planning, where I focused on waterfront development, um, waterfront planning, and um, industrial zoning. Um, we, 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 the port community, partnered with the City of Baltimore to develop um, zoning protections for uh, port properties that have deep water assets, um, acknowledging that those deep water assets cannot be replaced. So we have uh, land use protections in place for those properties um, in exchange for a more balanced approach to development of waterfront areas that do not have deep water ac access or assets. Um, so that's one part of our puzzle, and we are continuing to work on those protections as well as protecting the areas around our freight networks. So land surrounding our um, rail and highway access points um, to make sure that those are also protected and not cut off um, because of a new development or um, other implementation um, policies. Um, in addition, we have a very robust um, relationship with our surrounding communities. We learned um, back in the 80s um, the hard way um, after one of our communities took us to the Supreme Court. Um, Kristen might be able to talk about that a little bit more, but as a result of that, because of um, concerns about our dredge material um, placement facilities, we have increased our um, community engagement and community outreach processes where we have built relationships with, with our surrounding communities um, to the point where they now write uh, letters of support anytime we are um, out seeking grants from the federal government or others. Um, so we have made our communities, our surrounding communities, our partners. Um, and Kristen, I don't know if you wanna to touch on that a little bit too. Sure, I'm happy to elaborate. Thank you, Jill. So yeah, at the Port of Baltimore, we have a very robust outreach and stakeholder engagement program. We actually have 10 advisory committees that consist of public and private partners, as well as citizen stakeholders that we use to communicate with them, inform them about our projects, seek their feedback. We basically try to bring them along with us every single step of the way beginning with um, you know, citing a project, design, engineering, all the way through implementation and subsequent monitoring. And so and, you know, just to give a little example of that, 
years ago, this, this court case that um, Jill's referring to, this was a result of the citizens and communities in the state of Maryland really not having a good understanding of dredge material and the quality of the sediment and being very fearful of the sediment. And so in years, recent years, we have worked to create a paradigm shift in which we no longer view dredge sediment as a spoil, but rather a resource with value. And so rewind several years ago, we had citizens in the state of Maryland really fearing the reuse of sediment and dredge material. Fast forward to today, we actually have communities asking us for sediment for use in living shoreline projects and the revitalization of their recreational assets. So we've really come such a long way, but none of that would be possible without a robust outreach and stakeholder engagement program that we're incredibly proud of. Thanks, um, that was very interesting. Um, another question from someone in our audience. How does the long economic lifespan and substantial capital costs of port infrastructure constrict the flexibility of ports to adopt policies advancing greater resilience of climate change impacts? And are there any new innovative design concepts under development for infrastructure to address this reality? Um, uh, we can start with Josh. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. And I think that's where um, it's challenging, I think, to kind of hold this balance between, um, um, you know, needing to accelerate investments for long-term infrastructure, because we know this infrastructure is one, um, the infrastructure of the past, not the infrastructure of the future, which we know um, we're going to need to meet um, uh, the goals that we have either, you know, regionally, nationally, or globally. Um, two, these are very long uh, spans. Um, so certainly port infrastructure, you know, I use the case of, of vessels. You know, if we're going to have a decarbonized zero emission uh, shipping system by the year 2050, these are 25 to 30 year assets. And then you take into account construction, financing mechanisms. We have basically less than eight years, five to eight years to, under, to, to have and commercialize the fuel of the future so that in 2050 we can meet our targets. Not you know, much different with our port infrastructure, maybe not the same uh, length. So you know, is there flexibility there? Yeah, I think you know, um, states and regions uh, have the option to be flexible. Um, you just have to balance both the regulation in place to um, you know, be mindful of, of, of mitigation. Uh, but at the same time, allow investment and encourage investment, which means predictability, right? That's what we hear from industry and we hear from investors. We need this balance of mitigation and predictability. Uh, and that's not an always th easy thing to find. Jill's smirking uh, as a port leader uh, and uh, you know, our industry partners say, uh, say the same, uh, but it's not impossible. Um, and uh, there are some good mechanisms out there to look at. I, I look at the Norwegian Knox Fund as a really interesting mechanism. And this is where um, it's essentially uh, a tax on, uh, on uh, nitrous oxides and you can use it for whatever. But those dollars then are held specifically to bring back to industry in order to invest in new mitigation technologies. You know, so it's a combination of having dollars available uh, having the regulatory approach that uh, encourages investment and pulls that market forward uh, and bringing industry along with them. So not easy, but I think certainly doable. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. And just to add, um, the port industry is very competitive. So recognizing that adding resilience into all of our capital projects adds cost we have to make the business case for why that's important and it's important to our customers and so it becomes important to us um, the funding issue is very difficult for us as a um, transportation business unit under the maryland department of transportation we compete with fund compete for funds with the transit administration with the aviation administration um, and with state highways and uh, the Maryland uh, Transit Authority. So 
we struggle with finding the funds to implement our projects. That's why we use a lot of federal grant programs um, rather competitively. Um, we also have unique and innovative um, public-private partnerships. Our uh, Seagirt Marine Terminal is our dedicated container terminal, and that terminal is operated under a P3 agreement with Ports America Chesapeake. And so we partner with the private sector to help make those investments in our infrastructure um, both feasible and um, improving the relationship between the terminal and the customer um, and making the improvements that our customers need. So we use P3s as a way to sort of um, supplement our capital investments on um, one of our terminals, um, but we are always looking for those opportunities in other ways to um, provide additional resources. And it is a global issue. Um, we compete with other ports um, for business, so that's why the business case is so important. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for that really interesting uh, answer uh, and perspective, Jill. Um, we are going to have to wrap it up. It's one o'clock. Um, and so I just want to say thank you to Joshua, to Jill, and to Kristen for joining us today. This was an awesome panel. I learned so much um, about um, sort of the details of how ports are implementing resilience and also sort of the global context for all of this work happening. So really appreciate um, all the time you put into your presentations and for joining us today. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Amber for helping moderate today's briefing. Um, thank you to those behind the scenes, Henri, Dan O'Brien, Sydney O'Shaughnessy, uh, and also shout out to our interns, Emma, Joseph, Hamilton, and Karen. Uh, they help us in all sorts of ways to make this all possible. Um, this was a great discussion. It's a great way to kick off our transportation mini series. So as a reminder, join us back tomorrow at noon for a look at aviation or commercial aviation, low emissions commercial aviation. And then on Thursday, we're going to be back for a roundtable discussion, so a bit of a different format uh, to learn about transit, public transit. We're going to be talking with three um, representatives of uh, transportation authorities from around the country. So that's going to be a really uh, interesting briefing as well. Um, even though we're closing out, I hope you have maybe one to two minutes to help us out by taking a survey. Um, we pay very close attention to the feedback that you share with us. We hope you like our briefings, um, but if you have any suggestions for topics or ideas or um, you know, ways that we can improve, please feel free to share them with us. We're always trying to do better. Um, and, and we do really, really appreciate all that feedback. If you missed anything today, uh, one last plug for the website, www.eesi.org. Um, another plug for Climate Change Solutions, our biweekly newsletter. It's the best way to keep up with our briefings and fact sheets, et cetera. And it's a great way to also have a link to our brand new podcast, The Climate Conversation. We're dropping episode three next week. So one more thing to be thankful for during Thanksgiving week. Um, and it's a, it's a, we're off to a great start. It's a bit of a soft launch, but we're figuring it out. We're getting our sea legs. We're getting our podcast voices um, and, uh, and it's going really well. So we've already, uh, heard about trans uh, we had an aviation uh, speaker with us last time and uh, the first episode was about our coastal resilience report so uh, please check that out too um, we're end there thanks to everyone for joining us hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday and I hope to see you back tomorrow uh, for uh, low emissions commercial aviation thanks have a great day